G'day, welcome to the program. I'm David Lipson. Australia has long punched above its weight in science. You may already know we invented Wi-Fi, polymer banknotes, and also developed the world's first effective flu treatment. But it's not necessarily thanks to science being well funded. We spend about half a percent of GDP on science research. The OECD average is almost double that, 0.8%. South Korea, USA and Denmark, of course, spend much, much more. And even though the budget announcement of a medical research future fund paid for by the GP co-payment is being widely applauded, other areas of science are suffering budget cuts. And there are fears it'll have long-lasting consequences. On the program today, we'll speak to three of the country's top scientists to hear their concerns about the future of Australian science. But first, to the Finance Minister, Senator Matthias Cormann, who joins us from Perth. Thanks for your time today, especially since science is not your portfolio. We don't have a dedicated science minister. Those responsibilities were, of course, folded into the industry minister Mr. Ian McFarlane's responsibilities, but we do appreciate Who's your time. Who's doing an outstanding job. Who's doing an outstanding Today. job in that area, by the way. Yeah, and so, so why was funding cut to the CSIRO in this budget and, and other programs as well? Well, uh, David, firstly, when you are confronted with a $123 billion deficit uh, over the Ford estimates, uh, as we were, uh, then clearly uh, the only way you can uh, repair the budget uh, sustainably is by uh, spending uh, less into the future. Now, having said that, we're still uh, spending uh, significant amounts of taxpayers' uh, dollars into uh, science and into uh, organizations like the CSIRO. In fact, $4.3 billion uh, is invested uh, in uh, science and research uh, over the Ford estimates, including $3 billion uh, for the uh, CSIRO, $745 million this year and $3 billion over the Ford estimates. Uh, the, the savings that we have uh, uh, achieved or that we're targeting uh, from the CSIRO are about 3% of their total uh, funding. And, you know, when you're facing the sort of budget mess that we've inherited, the only way you can uh, get that back on track is by uh, asking uh, everyone to make a contribution. I mean, if we didn't also uh, ask organizations like the CSIRO to contribute, then uh, others uh, would have to carry a larger part of the burden, like pensioners, lower income earners and the like, and that wasn't acceptable to us. We thought that it was important uh, to spread the effort to repair the budget as fairly and as equitably and as broadly as possible. And I do commend the government for setting up the Medical Research Future Fund, which will be worth some $20 billion once it really gets going in a, in a few, t few years' time. But is it co incoherent, as your Liberal colleague Dennis Jensen has suggested, to be, if you like, ring-fencing one area of medical research, or, or of research, um, putting, putting a, a boundary around medical research, funding it well, while cutting other areas of science because there needs to be cross-pollination when it comes to, to research. Yeah. Uh, David, it's not incoherent at all, and uh, Dennis Jensen is, is a, a you know a valued colleague of mine, and he uh, does understand about science. But perhaps um, you know he needs, he needs to have a closer look at uh, the financing arrangements. And of course, what we're doing with the Medical Research Future Fund uh, is uh, directing uh, savings from recurrent spending uh, in, in health, as well as uh, revenue from the price signal, into a capital fund that builds up over time. Uh, which uh, incidentally helps us uh, reduce our net debt uh, position and uh, only the earnings, the net earnings from that fund uh, will be directed uh, into medical research into the future which will start at about $20 million in 15-16 and build up to about a billion dollars in additional uh, funding for medical research uh, into the future uh, year on year. Now th the key here is is that we are uh, putting a structure together that makes uh, that uh, doubling of uh, funding for medical research research self-sustaining uh, because only the net earnings uh, from the Medical Research Future Fund uh, will be directed uh, into that research. So what it means is that uh, we have a sustainable basis from which to effectively double uh, the level of investment into medical research into the future. Th the way we're doing it is by saving money, by spending less on a recurrent basis today and by uh, channeling uh, the revenue from uh, the price signal uh, in relation to access to medical services into that fund. That fund builds up, uh, which uh, actually has a positive impact on our balance sheet as it does that, uh, and uh, we are only 
uh, investing the earnings from that fund. So it is a very mm. uh, smart way to uh, ensure that increased funding for research uh, is put on a sustainable uh, footing for the future. And in other areas of research, does the government believe that private investment and philanthropy perhaps needs to, to step up and, and support Australian research? Well, we do think that there ought to be uh, that, that there ought to be support for uh, research from from all sources, not just uh, from from the public sector, but also from the private sector. And obviously, uh, if you uh, you know can attract private sector investment, it does uh, have uh, beneficial impacts in terms of improving uh, the discipline and the focus, and, and I guess the commercial potential uh, of uh, research that is that is conducted. So absolutely, we do uh, believe that. But but the broader point is really. Uh, in the sort of budget situation you're in, you really have no choice uh, but to take a more realistic view of what is affordable right now. There are a lot of meritorious causes that in an ideal world we would like to be able to pay for, but uh, at the end of the day you can't keep spending money that you haven't got uh, without getting yourself into trouble over time. Okay, well, we will return to science with our panel a little later in the program, but Matthias Coleman, just while I have you, a few other questions more generally on the sure. budget. Since we spoke a fortnight ago, are you any more confident that the government will be able to pass through the 23, uh, the 21, I should say, billion dollars in savings measures that Labor has lined up against? Do you think they will ultimately uh, all pass through? Uh, well, I mean, let's see. I mean, I can't obviously predict what the Labour Party will uh, eventually do, as I can't predict what other um, parties represented in the Senate will do. But what I can uh, note, though, when we last met, uh, the Labour Party was still saying that they would be uh, opposed and would not support uh, our temporary budget repair levy. Uh, now uh, they are uh, supporting our temporary budget repair levy. So, uh, because clearly uh, they have accepted and have realised on reflection and having listened to our arguments, I suspect, uh, that it was uh, the fair and appropriate way to go in the uh, context of the budget mess that we've inherited from Labor. But Clive now, Palmer, for example, has hardened up his position. He says now he, he won't even talk to the government. Well, all we can do, uh, David, is continue to explain uh, the decisions that we've made, the reasons uh, for those decisions, and we are uh, doing that calmly and, uh, and, and carefully, day in, day out. Uh, and, I mean, there is no alternative to the budget that we've uh, delivered. Uh, we did uh, face uh, a budget uh, in very bad shape, but even uh, worse, like we faced a spending growth trajectory that was completely unsustainable and that would have uh, hurt uh, the economy, hurt jobs uh, over time if we hadn't uh, taken corrective action. We are taking corrective action. Uh, we're doing it in the, uh, in, in the fairest possible way. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, people in the Senate will have to obviously form their own judgments, but we will be putting the, Senate, the budget to the Senate uh, in the way that it was delivered. The Education Minister, Christopher Pine, is in the headlines again today over comments that he said uh, to the, uh, the non-government education sector. He said it's the Prime Minister's view that the government has a particular responsibility for non-government schooling that we don't have for state government schooling. What does that mean? Well, it's the Prime Minister's view and it's the government's view that we uh, have uh, you know, an important responsibility for both government and non-government schools. And if you uh, look at our track record, uh, we are investing uh, $1.2 billion more in schools over the Ford estimates than the previous uh, government did because uh, in the dying days of uh, the previous Labour government, uh, they ripped uh, $1.2 billion uh, out of uh, both government and non-government schools in Western Australia, Queensland and the Northern Territory, which we we have uh, put uh, back in. I mean, you know, without any doubt, we have a, a significant responsibility for both government and uh, non-government schools, but bearing in mind, uh, government schools uh, in Australia under our system of government uh, are run by state governments. They are state uh, schools and, uh, and, and obviously, uh, you know, that, that is uh, very relevant in, in this context. So does the government believe that ultimately the states then should take full control of not just running, but also funding um, public, public education? 
Well, state governments are uh, fully in control of running uh, state schools. Um, and, uh, you know, what we've already said is that in the context of the Federation uh, White Paper, there ought to be a, a conversation about, uh, you know, making sure that state governments are truly responsible and accountable for their areas uh, of responsibility. We do think that in our current federal system of government, there is too much uh, overlap in responsibilities, which dilutes uh, proper lines of accountability, that there is too much uh, waste and duplication as a result and that there is opportunity to improve our broader governance arrangements uh, which ultimately uh, would help deliver better outcomes at a lower cost. Finance Minister Matthias Coleman, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for your time. Always good to talk.